Hi, welcome everyone. We're going to get started in a couple minutes. While we wait, maybe you can send over in the chat your name and where you're dialing in from today. We'll get started at about 10.02. All right, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Victoria, I'm from Sapling, and we're hosting this webinar on embedding values in the employee lifecycle along with our partner, Think Human. A little about Sapling. Sapling is an onboarding and HRIS platform for high growth global teams built to facilitate data-driven decisions, automate HR processes, and elevate your org's employee experience so you can refocus from people admin to people strategy. And we're honored to work with customers all around the world like Kayak and Sephora, KPMG, and more. Think Human works with growth organizations like Spotify and SoulCycle, Flatiron Health, leading leadership development and manager training to support thriving growth cultures. We have incredible panelists today that our moderator will introduce who are going to answer your questions. Many of you submitted questions in your registration form, so thank you so much for doing so. And you can also keep submitting them in the QA button on the bottom of your screen and submit them there. And now I'm really excited to turn this over to Meredith, the Think Human CEO and moderator for today's panel. All right, awesome. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much, Victoria. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with everybody today, and uh, let's get this party started. So we have, as Victoria said, incredible panelists here today talking about embedding core values in the employee life cycle, and they're going to be taking your questions. So as a starting point, 
Nobody who decided to spend their morning doing this needs me to tell you that over the last chunk of years, culture has been the hot thing in the world of HR and the world of business more broadly. Everywhere we go, people are talking about it and for great reason. There is a lot of real hard data showing that with great thriving culture, you are able to attract the best people. They do better work individually and collectively. You get better retention. You get 2x profits. That's according to Gallup. Uh, according to Wharton Harvard, they say 3x profits, but let's just go with the more conservative number. Needless to say, companies are spending a lot of money on this. And over the last, uh, just I think four years, U.S. businesses, no, it's five years, U.S. businesses have spent $4 billion on culture efforts. A lot of money. What is that, what is that spend going toward? It's going toward things like wellness programs and beautiful office spaces and kombucha in the office. And I don't know about you, but I like it when I go to the offices that have those things. I'm happy, right? Uh, but we all know that in spite of that $4 billion spend, engagement has stayed the same and attrition is going the wrong way. Yikes. So really unfortunate stats. And yet, in spite of this prevailing set of data, there are some companies that are nailing it. And as they've scaled through significant growth, they've managed to maintain thriving cultures, cultures that have actually helped them scale uh, and ones that people not only want to join, but ones where people want to stay and give their best. So this thing begs the question, what do those companies know that everybody else seems to be missing? And lucky for us, we have the right people here today to share with us. So uh, let me introduce some of the panelists really amazing people that I am honored to get to talk to today. We have Christina, the Chief People Officer at Rapid7, a hyper-growth cybersecurity company with off-the-hook Glassdoor and comparably ratings in a long list of recognition and culture accolades. Then we have Desiree, VP of People and Talent from Alation. Alation is a tech and media business and home of Crunchyroll, the world's largest destination for anime. And over the last two years, Alation's business has more than doubled and spread across three continents. Then we have Bart, CEO of Sapling, an HRIS that automates onboarding workflows and data-driven people decisions and is used by growth companies like Udemy, KPMG, Sephora, and Sapling also, like our other panelists, off the charts glass door scores. And then we have Analia, the head of talent for Flatiron Health, a company that has made the news this year for uh, selling, being acquired this year for just shy of $2 billion when it was only six years old. And Flatiron is a mission-driven oncology platform that uses big data to allow cancer researchers and care providers to learn from the experience of every patient and therefore improve treatment and accelerate research. So amazing human beings that we get to have here today. Please be asking your questions. So many of you already submitted questions in your registration. Hopefully you see the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Submit questions in there and uh, let's go. So starting broadly with context and Christina, Let's start with you, but for this question, let's hear from everybody. From your point of view, why is it a business imperative for core values to be Im embedded in the employee life cycle? Why is it a priority for you worth taking time and energy from other things to devote to this? Um, well, candidly, I think that it, it, you can't scale. Uh, you can scale a little bit. You can't scale successfully uh, without that sort of knowing who you are element, right? I think for a long time, I've been focused on culture for a long time. And in the early days, you know, I, I am like older than these panelists by like probably 20 years, but it, like when we started thinking about this culture, wasn't really a thing. And, um, and what we found was over time, as you really identify who you are and figure out what those core values are that are you, you unique company, right? What we have might not be what Bart has, and that's totally okay. It works for Sapling. It works for Rapid7. You have to know who your individual identity is, and then you have to weave it into every element of the employee life cycle from the minute that you reach out to your candidate to the day you part ways with people. 
and that's how you scale and and live it and when it's just talk or when it becomes just about the kombucha you know that that's not going to get people maybe it attracts people initially to your front door but it sure doesn't retain people and as you're building your organization i mean it is, it is pricey and timely and everything to to replace people to not have people connected having a set of core values that everybody understands and believes in and embodies is kind of the, the DNA. It's like going into a relationship without sort of knowing those two things. You might be, you might be attracted to each other, but if you don't really connect at the gut level, you're never, you're never going to be in a long-term relationship. You don't want to treat your company like Tinder, I guess is basically where I'm at. <laughs> I like it. All right, great. And uh, Bart, what about for you? Why is it an imperative and what does it solve? Yeah, great, great question. And I think definitely agreeing with Christina, and I think this is going to be, will be a thread that comes up uh, throughout the next 50 or so minutes around uh, helping companies scale more effectively and, and, and efficiently as well. Um, I'll part, I'll, I guess I'll focus on a certain part of the employee life cycle, which is really the, the candidate experience. I think having a really thoughtful, uh, unified and well understood set of values across an organization helps in a couple of ways uh, around that candidate experience and really attracting the best. You talked before, Meredith, around glass door profiles, and I think in the, the era that we're in today, uh, candidates, it's, it's such a candidate centric market. There is so much choice, and with the average in, uh, tenure for knowledge workers in the US being one year, sorry, 19 months uh, today. Uh, Obviously, employees are just moving on quicker than ever before. And so having, uh, having a really consistent, intentional set of values that everyone from the recruiters to the CEO can share to their candidates, when a candidate comes in and effectively gets to interview two or three and says, I'm speaking with five or six other companies, perhaps some of your competitors, why should I join you? Um, there is a really compelling response in, that the company can provide to say, hey, you should join us because of, you know, here is our value set, here's our culture, here's what it means to be a, an employee of the company, uh, and that's shared. And that's really on the, the attraction side. I think secondly, and, and related to that, having a really uh, consistent and, 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 again, unified and understood value set helps the hiring team also identify what types of folks they are, and importantly, are not trying to bring onto the team. I think we let so many uh, false positives come through during hiring and there's some incredible literature out there. I know the team at, at Google has published a swath of some fascinating data back studies uh, around hiring effectiveness and, and applying data to their hiring programs. But again, having that true North Star for an end person hiring committee to be able to come back to and say, this is why I scored candidate Joe, uh, a two out of four, because I don't think they exemplify behaviors around these four values. It really brings it from a, a level of subjectivity back to more objectivity. Yes, so from attracting and hiring the right people versus the wrong people, retaining them, guiding difficult decisions, shaping priorities, being a rallying force that deepens a sense of shared identity, from the beginning to the end, core values are a uh, unifying force. I know I said I was gonna have everybody answer that question, but I'm seeing Q, uh, QA come into my feed here. So I'm gonna move it along. And Emily, I'm gonna ask you to ask this, answer this next question. This is from Kate in Agora Hills. She's asking, what are the best questions, the best questions to ask to get a company to determine their core values? So Analia, while you're answering that, for anybody that's listening as a participant, if you have a great question, just killer questions, throw them in the comments box and share with the community. And Analia, let's hear from you. Analia, are you there? It looks like she froze. All right, let's try, uh, let's try you, Desiree. You have a great set of questions or a couple of questions for how to get at what are a company's core values? Um, this is a great question. And I have to say that, you know, I think I froze too. Am I back on? Yeah. Um, so Elation, the way Elation came to be, Elation is a corporate entity that now owns and operates our other assets. But the founding company was Crunchyroll. So we were um, a subscription video service 
very niche, um, anime demographic, very passionate group of folks. And so for us, we went through many different stages of the company where we grew very quickly with headcount. We didn't have a very clear set of defined values and we ran into trouble as we were scaling. And so what we noticed was that our teams were siloing and that different teams were operating in different ways that weren't really aligning with what our mission was. And so as a forcing function, we almost had to take a step back and say, hey, look, you know, we're, we're changing as a corporate company. We're acquiring a lot of different companies and we're growing very rapidly. And the values became our North Star. And so we literally had to um, sit down, have a conversation with the executive team, but also we wanted to, to have the company feel like they were also involved. And how do you do that when you have, you know, over 300 um, employees and you're also in, you know, different countries? It's very challenging. But I think that um, for us, since we didn't have it, you know, figured out from day one, we, we felt that it was really important to, to ensure that people were involved in the process. So what we did was we held um, smaller groups um, we started with a process of kind of narrowing down, you know, what we definitely are not, and then highlighting where we felt like we were adding value based on our, our content, our providers, our licensing agreements. It had to be, it had to depict all of the different ways that we wanted to work. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you know, it wasn't a democracy. It wasn't going to, you know, we did have to come to a decision, but by allowing a forum where people could actually voice what they thought um, at least it gave our employees an opportunity to feel like they were part of that process. So I feel like it's really essential, especially when you're going through so many changes and maybe you're not, um, you know, from day one, you don't have it figured out. Like, you know, we didn't have it figured out and we just have to be transparent about that. And I think our employees are more supportive of the fact that we took that perspective. Great. Thank you so much, Desiree. So firstly, one of the participants is asking, will a recording of this webinar be available? Because people are saying like, oh my God, good stuff. I can't get it down fast enough. So Jessica, who's asking that, yes, it, the recording will be available. Good news for you. And uh, next question is, uh, let's see, who is asking this question? Um, it's about buy-in and communication. And the question is from Vanessa in San Diego. And uh, Bart, maybe you want to take a first stab at this question. It's once you have the values articulated and consider them a priority, can you just start embedding them in the process or do you need to take the time to get buy-in throughout the org? And if you need buy-in, what tips do you have for getting the leaders, the managers, and the people throughout the company bought in? That's a juicy question. I like it. <laughs> Great. So yeah, coming back there, I just paraphrasing that question, how do we get buy-in, uh, importantly, from leadership all the way down? And then secondly, how do we uh, communicate and articulate those values across the organization? So I think part one of that question, the, the buy-in, I think, as Desiree mentioned before, and, and some great experiences there, um, kind of retrofitting some of the, the value statement, it sounded like once, a, once Elation had already reached some scale, scale both in terms of headcount but also international presence as well which certainly adds complexity with the the tyranny of distance um i think what we certainly learned here at, at south is we've been an international company since day one as well and desiree also mentioned a word around kind of the, the north star i think that's something that Certainly at, at, at Sapling, our, our leadership team recognized that it was critically important that the leadership was involved in really providing that painted picture of wh who do we want to become as a company, uh, you know, 6, 12, 18, 36 months out. How do we want our stakeholders to think about us in the community, our customers, uh, our, the clients we work with, other vendors, uh, our employees, their family members, uh, and really go and do that listening tour to get that, that buy-in uh, from your own employee base. Once we then have that consolidated list of what our uh, what we felt our four core values were uh, as those unifying guiding stars uh, at I'm sorry North Stars at, at Sapling, something that we actually do in terms of rituals is that our founding team will actually get up and, and communicate those values to uh, every new hiring employee as they join the organisation. So again, it's really um, you know, demonstrated from the top down that the founding team will commit time to, to running through some of that orientation in their first week, not only talking about what the value is, but what are some of the examples of behaviors that um, marry across each one of those core values. So that's something that we, we constantly refer back to around ensuring that leaders across our team are, are definitely referring back to and, and are promoting behaviors that are aligned to our values. 
in terms of communication, I'll have got the second part of the question, which was how do we ensure that those values uh, don't just stay as nice placards on, on the wall uh, or it's just kind of, you know, the, the, the rhetoric, which I think we've, we've all come used to or, or probably been part of an organisation where if you ask someone what are, what are, what's one of our five or seven or nine core values that they, they struggle to, to recall that. Um, and that's something that we've been, we believe, we, we try to be very intentional around um, creating that, that level of understanding. There are a couple of tactics in how we do that. Number one, uh, at our company All Hands, which we still run on a weekly basis, we give shout outs to team members, um, calling out some of their behaviors that have directly linked back across to uh, one of our four core values at Zaplin. Also, because we do have a geographically distributed team, uh, we have a, a digital office environment, which I'm sure many of the listeners and other panelists have here today, which is all run through Slack. Um, we actually have a, a Slack bot, which uh, you can um, call out and, and give appreciation to other team members um, for certain behaviors. And again, it's kind of a, a cultural norm here that you, the, the way that that appreciation is presented is thank you to so-and-so team member for X behavior, which aligns with hashtag company core value. Um, and so every day there must be 50 to 100 of these appreciation shout outs to go out, which are all linked back to one of our four core values. Amazing. All right. You covered a lot of ground there, Bart. I'm going to break down into different pieces and hear from some other people about each of the different categories because you covered many different parts of the employee lifestyle. I'm going to back it up for a second to ask a question that Alice is asking specifically from at the very beginning. How are you guys weaving core values into the interview process? What suggestions do you have for people uh, about how to ask behavior-based questions and how are you weaving that into the interview process. So that's uh, from Alice and Christina. Do you want to take the first cut at that one? Sure. So specifically, how how do we weave them in? Is that did I hear it right? So similar, Bart, your your story actually resonated. I mean, we took so, so like sounds like we do things fairly similarly. When we started, um, when I joined, we were about seventy-five people. We had nothing articulated in terms of our value set. We thought we had some ideas, but what we ended up doing was taking about a third of the company and um, and they were sort of cultural icons, if you will. So people that we thought really, even though we couldn't articulate it, we thought were really good examples of people that we wanted to bet on in the company and and would scale and, and, and lived values that we thought we would probably ultimately end up pointing to. And rather than having the leadership team or the founders say, these are our values, now go hang them on a poster and go memorize them. Instead, we spent probably two months with this group of people that represented every level, every um, team and the few offices we had at the time. And we, we really identified not just who we thought we were, but who we wanted to be. So some of them were rather aspirational at the time. But where it really landed, so that's a, that could be a really long story, but what we ended up doing with it was once we had them all signed off on and everybody was bought in, we had a third of the company like as flag-waving culture carriers at that point. And it became really easy to then say, okay, let's look literally, if you can just like, I'm making like stupid circles in the air, but like think of an employee life cycle as like you immediately, the, the day you reach out to a candidate to the day they walk out the door and everything in between, we started prioritizing what are the, what are the most impactful things that we can do to add processes and things like we didn't even have like a set hiring plan, anything, but how do we, every process that we create, how does it map back to our core values? So for example, if we promote someone, we won't promote anyone just because they hit a sales number or they had a great year. We look at their skills base, but we also look at attitude, aptitude, and culture fit. So if you're not contributing to our culture in some way, and it doesn't mean you have to turn into the me, it means you're just doing something that's like pushing our values ahead, then you're probably not getting promoted. And it's holding yourselves accountable to not just identify the process where you weave them in, but you actually live that. And then people really understand Bart kept mentioning the word behaviors, and that's all what it's about, like really helping people to understand this is what good look, we, like we have a grid now with all our core values on them with behaviors, just as examples of like teamwork might mean something totally different at X company, but here it means this, that's one of our values. And if you're a good team player, this is what it looks like. This is what great looks like. This is what meh looks like. And this is what totally shitty looks like. And, and, you know, we don't expect everyone to be completely perfect on everything, but you should certainly be, you know, 
pushing towards that way on our values. Um, so where, that's do you have those, where do you have that behavior grid? How do people get oriented to it? They get um, introduced to it in our onboarding. And then it's woven into everything else that we do, like whether it's leadership training or when we're talking to you about promoting your career and all those kinds of things. Awesome. All right, Analia, welcome back. Next question for you. So Chelsea is asking, what are you guys doing to weave core values into the interview process specifically and onboarding process? Specific tactical things that she can borrow. Awesome. And sorry for the technical difficulty on my end. Um, so for the interview process, we have essentially banned the term culture fit. So we really try to get people to talk about culture fit in terms of the values. Um, so in our interview process, we have come up with specific uh, behavior-based interview questions that map to each of our, well, I should probably say eight of our 10 values. Um, and we actually have a cross-functional interview slot on every single candidate lineup. So our way of being consistent to test values is we have an interview slot that is dedicated to testing values and teamwork. Um, and we ask the same questions across the lineup and, and that way we can really consistently test for values. Um, so just to give a, an example, um, one of our values is around being vocally self-critical. So we ask a question about, you know, tell us about a time where someone was frustrated with you or you upset someone, how did you handle that? Um, we'll also ask a question about, you know, what would you do differently on that project in hindsight? So we'll ask specific questions to get a read on, is this person willing to engage and be vocally self-critical? Um, a really tactical thing we do to keep it top of mind in the interview process is we use greenhouse and, and baked into our scorecards is the values grid. So when someone goes to write interview feedback, they're going to automatically be prompted to see that list of 10 values. It's a really tactical way to make sure people hit on those things um, when they write feedback for an interview. Um, but I think shifting to values fit versus culture fit has reduced some of the bias in the process and, you know, kept people away from the, you know, would you want to have a beer with this person test and more of the, what are the behaviors that make me want to collaborate with this person? Um, and then on the onboarding front, um, one thing we do that I really like is we do a value session as part of our onboarding curriculum. Um, and I think what's special about it is that it's actually led by our senior leaders. So it really shows that our leaders are bought in um, and we give really specific anecdotes for each value of a story or an example of, of how this showed up in day-to-day -day work. So people come into that session and get a real sense of how do people live these values day to day. They're not just something on the walls, but this, this is how they could show up at work. Um, so I think that's how we sort of connect from, from interviewing to onboarding. Awesome. All right. So anybody else feel, Desiree, Bart, or Christina, anybody who's like, I have to answer that question before I move on? No. Okay, great. So I'm going to ask a question now from, and feel free to interrupt me if, if I didn't get to you, but uh, this question came from Laura, who's asking, how are you working this into leadership uh, and into leadership development? So uh, who, wants to, who wants to jump at that one? How are you working your values into your leadership development? I'll grab it. I, we, we tie them, as I said, like we tie them into everything. So we interview for them. We promote for them we fire for them. So I was telling the other panelists a story about how we take it so seriously. We take our values so seriously um, because they've allowed us to scale with some soul, if you will, um, that we realized it was like put to the test about two years ago. We hired somebody, our, our company was scaling really quickly. We were looking to hire and kind of upgrade in a particular role on our leadership team, brought somebody in from the outside who we thought um, from a skill perspective was going to escalate us really quickly, um, had some questions on fit or like real adaptability to our values, but talked a great game. And we thought, okay, this is worth making a bet on, right? At some point, you don't have all the information. You just got to roll the dice and make a bet. And it was an epic fail, you know, really talented person, probably right person, absolutely wrong company. Um, and we, now that we're public, you know, we have the very challenging situation of having to tell you know our investors on an earnings call hey we just found this phenomenal leader and they're going to be joining us and literally six months later we were telling them we had parted ways and you know the fact that we had made those decisions really quickly um and and it you know like damage was done really quickly with that individual in this role because they just did not live our values and it was it was so 
so, so helpful to actually see that in action, right? We talk a lot about it. We see when it's going well, but it was the first time that we had ever seen on a sort of a dramatic level what happens when you don't have somebody who's living those values and how much damage it can do to a major team in a very short period of time, so. All right, Christina, it's great. You're giving an example of where uh, it sounds like it's pretty universally agreed that this person was strikingly not embodying core value. Right. Leah but, from Rouge is out. Oh yeah, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, but as it pertained to the rest of the leadership team, like that was the gut check for all of us of like, we all need to live these, right? If you like, we have been talking about it. Everybody was sort of signed on. And, and I think we've done a pretty good job hiring leaders that, that we feel are really good fits that way. But it sort of re-leveled the bar for everybody to say, how much am I truly living these values? Am I weaving them through my teams? It's not enough for me to believe it. Are my next people in line living them as well? So it's really, it sort of really held a mirror to our faces about how strong our leaders are. And if they're not, you know, we're working remedially with them because they don't last, but the bottom line is they don't last very long if they're not, if they're not truly living them. And that for us starts with our CEO, right? If he, he's, he's holding the bar so high for our other leaders. Yes, so I hear. Can I chime in Meredith on that question? Yeah, what we did is we formulated an ELT group, which is our Lation leadership team. And so we really wanted um, it, you know, to the values to trickle down because, you know, our process of defining them was it's, it's only been about a year now. And so for us to drive it across the organization, we wanted to have our um, senior leaders and our director level and below really help become our influencers and represent everyone in the company. And so it was something that in order for us to drive that change, it, you know, it had to be from a top down and a bottom up perspective so that everybody kind of came together and became excited about what we were becoming and how we were defining it. So for us, it was, it was really a defining moment for elation and it really helped to guide our international growth as we continue to expand in Europe, for example, Bart knows he's, he, Sapling actually really helped us pioneer a lot of those changes too. So I think you have to have an intentional and concerted effort. And so that was one thing that we did. We, we specifically formulated this group of individuals um, that were nominated from the leadership team and that represented and became influencers in our organization. And people take that very seriously. It's actually been very successful for us. And did you find that that group was self-reflective, not just looking at how did they externalize core values elsewhere yeah. in the organization, but looking at how well they were embodying them? How did you, like, how was that facilitated? Well, very quickly, it was pointed out because initially, you know, it was something we just wrote on the wall, right? And um, one of our values is one team, one company, because we were expanding and acquiring different companies. How do we bring everyone together? Well, when you're not doing that, people will very quickly point that out to you. So for example, um, our team in Europe we were in, and our team in Japan, we were not including them in the all hands. They would have to watch it on a video recording later. And is that really inclusive of one team, one company? No, so we had to take a step back. We ended up changing the cadence of our all hands so that all of our team, I mean, it was a tough one because we're across different time zones, but you have to be willing to commit to it again with intention and you have to be, um, really great with the communication and really transparent. And when people call you out, you can't shy away from those hard questions. You actually have to hit it head on. And so people asked, hey, what about Japan? What about the new people in Moldova? Guess what? Now we need to take a step back and kind of redefine it. So I, what I loved about it was we were willing to, to put our hands up and say, hey, you know, we didn't get that one right, but thank you for holding us accountable. And now we could pivot and actually make a more concerted effort. So. Um, I, we didn't get it right on try one, but I love that we were open, you know, to iterating and, and to growing and to really standing behind those values after we committed to them. We have a bunch of questions that came in about specific misalignments. So I'm going to throw out a couple of them there. Lauren from Salt Lake City is asking, uh, when a certain org, whole org, is, in, is known for not practicing the values, how have you handled that? So any of you feel like you can jump in and answer that question from Lauren? I can. <laughs> we, we, had a, we had a tough time. I have to say our engineering department is almost 70% of our company. And, you know, they're just, we have dispersed workforce and engineering. And initially people were not, you know, again, I mentioned they were kind of operating in silo. 
Um, and so one thing we did was we organized a hackathon and we had requirements that were intentional. So for example, if you were to enter, you had to have two people from the, one of the other offices. So you couldn't just you know, pick everyone from the, the headquarters. You had to actually have a team that was representative of the company. Um, and you had to tie your development effort, whatever you were going to you know, submit for the hackathon to one of the values. So we, we imposed those criteria and initially people didn't love that, but we, what we were trying to do was get our teams, especially our engineering and product team to come together. And they were super excited about, um, we did this over literally a 24 hour period and people were super excited to kind of put halts on regular day to day and actually get to be creative and actually get to work with other people in a different way. So it, we've only done it once and we're planning to do it again um, this next year. Um, and it was really successful, but it was one of the things that we did because we noticed the teams were um, kind of putting their foot down and saying, hey, you know, I, I'm going to continue to work in my silo. And we, we were trying to be creative with how we challenged that thought process. Great. Anybody else have something they want to jump, jump in with about misalignment? It could be regarding an org or we have a separate question from San Francisco. What if a specific employee embodies a bunch of the values except one particular value and how big of an issue is that and how do you handle it? Christine? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Analia, great. More on um, sort of a, a, a team level, so not quite a whole org or one individual, but I think we have had large teams um, where we're seeing some values misalignment across the team. And I think in those cases, for us, the first step is making sure that we're stepping back and explaining the business impact of the values. So not just, you know, why it makes people happy to be here, but why this is critical to our business. So making sure they understand that our values should align both our internal brand and our external brand. So the way that we interact with our clients and our customers also needs to mirror the way you interact internally with employees. Um, so I think that could, that was one helpful hook that we started with. And also that what we put on our website for our values, we want that to really bring true for both external clients and internal employees. So we did a series of kind of team communication skills workshops. Um, a lot of them were centered around um, you know, aligning on a common purpose and mission and kind of bringing people that back to that shared mission. Um, and then talking about really specific tactical norms for how do we work cross-functionally together. Um, and then having kind of a system or a pulse check in, in place for assessing progress. So once we sort of agreed on some communication norms, how frequently do we check in on those? Um, and I think we did start to move the needle because I think people were able to rally around the idea that working on this isn't just um, good for my internal brand. It's actually going to ultimately help my customer too. Great. Yeah. Okay, let's jump in off the, the back of that as well. I think uh, Annalee and, and, and Desiree brought up some, some great points there. Um, talking about values misalignment and again across specific teams, not just the organization. Um, Desiree talked about functional departments, the example of um, in, in engineering. Also heard about the elation stories of kind of different entities being absorbed in and assimilated uh, locations as, as well. I think that's definitely an example just to, to touch on the location um, with, a, with a geographically distributed teams at a uh, prior company I was at grew very quickly from about 30 to uh, 30 employees to close to 800 employees uh, in the span of two and a half years. Um, four locations, uh, three in the US and one in APAC uh, to then 17 locations internationally. So hyper, definitely hyper growth. And uh, what we started to see was this kind of fragmentation between like the hubs and spokes, the hubs being back in the United States and then spoke basically smaller country offices, which were filled with uh, really go to market or, or sales, marketing and, and customer success folks. Interestingly, these uh, international locations did not have any people operations or HR presence. And so we started to see this real divide over time. I certainly see this happening with many organizations, the kind of the invisible employees, uh, when they're kind of out of sight, out of mind, perhaps even on a different time zone uh, as well. And so a lot of these, uh, this kind of imbalance was illuminated during uh, many of these culture and value surveys that we started rolling out across the business really pulse checking and understanding. And again, having these listening tours, um, a lot of this feedback was then surfaced back up to the leadership team who, um, you know, really immediately put this kind of barbell strategy in place where it was top down leadership presence coming in, doing a, you know, on the boots on the ground, listening tour and, and meeting with, with, with folks, as well as then a bottom up approach to, um, 
the, the people to team department back in HQ really working and helping to coach the local country managers uh, to be more, uh, again, intentional around the importance of creating that streamlined and, and unified culture and value set internationally. Awesome. Well, that jumps to another question that came in from Trisha. So I'm going to stay in this topic, Bart, that you started, which is Trisha from Toronto is asking, how do you ensure core values are maintained during hyper growth and lack of structure? So you just talked about across geographic location. Uh, any of you, uh, anyone other than Bart willing to jump in about how you have scaled values during hyper growth? especially as Trisha points out during, given the lack of structure that can happen. Christina, go for it. Yeah, I mean, I, I th I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but I mean, I think weaving it into everything you do and then not just assuming you're done. Like what works, when you're a small company, it's easy to, to do it. You can say, here's our processes and this is how you weave it in. That could feel very differently at 100 than it feels at 250, which is gonna feel different at 500, 2000, especially as you're adding different geographic locations or people are working from home or whatever. You can never think you're done with this, right? It's, it's like, I, I love relationship analogies, but it's like a healthy relationship, right? I mean, it's like you're married for too long and things are going to get stale. If you just keep doing the same exact dinner every night, you never go out. But if you're always refreshing and always of the mind that this is, this is as important as continuing to elevate your product strategy or your sales or whatever, like it is core to your business health. So not just doing it once and then thinking you've got it covered um, is not going to be enough. It's really looking, you know, whether it's every year or whatever cadence you want to do, but constantly reassessing, is it working for our population today? Um, and what's our, where are we going and what do we need to refresh this? So, you know, we, we started off, we've never had them hanging anywhere. You'll never walk into a Rapid7 office and find our core values because it became so important to me that you don't just know them, you have to embody them and live them. And then when you stay, it's lazy to just hang it up, right? And just say, go memorize it, because that's not gonna really challenge people to understand what it means. But as we got a little bit larger, we started thinking, okay, now it's not just by osmosis, the new person you sit next to when you add a new person every month or whatever, you know, one per one on one, and you can coach them to understand it. Now we're hiring bulks of people, so you know it's completely changed how we onboard people. It's completely changed. Like we just did the grid thing that I was talking about earlier last year. Um, so every probably every six months or so, we're constantly looking to refresh how we try to weave them in to scale. And are you looking for breaks in the system? Like, are you hunting for it as you grow? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's, there's places that like, if I just, you know, throw open all our dirty laundry, you know, we have five core values. Some of them are phenomenal. And we have, I like Bart's Slack system. We have a different system of guitar picks, which is way too complicated to explain, but anybody in the company can give each other a guitar pick. And um, one of the, and they weave into our core value awards. Our whole award system is based on our core values. Um, and we do it quarterly and it's kind of a big deal. But um, one of the things that we realized as we were watching guitar picks get posted and they had to be correlated to a value is that discipline risk taking, which is our sort of nod to innovation, was our least nominated thing. And we're like, here we're a company, like a cyber company that is, you know, innovating in so many different ways. Why is that so low? Are people truly not comfortable taking risks? Are they not innovating? And it really caused us to, to just a basic data point, which is we're not getting as many nominations to are our leaders truly challenging our people to take risks and learn from them. Um, and it changed the way that we started coaching our leaders to how to manage their teams just based on core value data. So, I mean, we really, we really try to look at it from a lot of different vectors to make sure that we're, we're paying attention and making right changes. And to come back to a question from the beginning of this uh, panel, who's doing the looking for the breaks in the system? Is it the people team? Is it you? Is it a whole we, uh, we look at it from a bunch of different, I mean, like, obviously I do it. Our leadership team does it. My team, my people strategy team does it. Um, but we've, we've like trained our managers now to look for breaks in the system too and to call it out when they don't see it happening. So we've got points now where we've got a manager who says, this is really important. Our values are really important to how I'm growing and developing my team. But I've got some challenges because the director above me isn't as bought in as I am. And that then we swoop in and try to really work with the director to 
to remediate, but like we've got people calling each other out in a pretty healthy way, but to really hold ourselves accountable because when we're not, especially with people that are in charge of other people, it just, it's, it's a house of cards. And is there anything that you can add for the people listening about how to embed that level of accountability across the organization? I know you've mentioned a bunch of things already, but if you were going to be like the most important. If I had like the most important thing, it's, it's like your CEO has got, I'm going to be crass, but like has got to give a shit, right? Because if I see so many really talented people who have so many great ideas to enhance their culture, but if the person who's ultimately responsible for setting the tone for the organization is not bought in, doesn't mean they have to know how to do it. But if they're not bought in and supportive and willing to hold their leadership team accountable, it's probably time to go to the, the next company because it's just, it's never going to get the traction that it needs. You need the support of that person to drive any of this to, to actually fruition. Yeah, so we're going to do a final question now for everybody. So all of you, please listen close because you're going to answer this question. Uh, advice, if you could leave the audience with one practical piece of high leverage advice, like one single action they can take that you think is the most important they can, thing they can do to embed values in the employee life cycle, what is that one piece of advice? And Analia, let's start with you. Sure. I, I think my advice would be to, to choose the the one or two people processes that you're going to double down in terms of embedding it. I think for us, it's onboarding because we're in rapid growth. So it depends what your growth mode is. But I think um, embedding it into onboarding and making sure you have a structured process for teaching new hires and for having managers hold new hires accountable um, will ensure that as you grow, that the new people that you're bringing in are going to really understand the values um, and not just see them as, as kind of platitudes. So, so that would be my advice is really embed it into your onboarding and have a system for kind of holding people accountable at the end of their 90 day onboarding period. And what is that system you guys have right now at 90 days? Yeah, so for us, we, um, we've switched to um, kind of a uh, self-directed 90-day feedback check-in. So at the 90-day mark, we actually ask the new hire to take the accountability of scheduling that 90-day check-in with their manager and going over, you know, what they think is going well, um, where they'd like more support and, and, you know, where they think they need to focus. And as part of that check-in, we ask them to highlight, um, you know, ways that they think they've been able to demonstrate the values and areas where they want to learn more about the values. So we kind of embed that into the end of the onboarding process. Awesome. Thank you for the practical wisdom. Desiree, how about you? Yeah, I would say um, be intentional. Um, make sure that your artifacts are aligned, that the things that you're saying and the things that you're you know, printing in all hands, or we actually send a weekly newsletter. And again, we reinforce what the values are in that newsletter. So we do a lot of tactical things, but you have to be intentional and you have to continually reinforce. Um, and the other thing I would say is find a few of your influencers internally and leverage them because um, you'd be amazed at how quickly, you know, some of these things kind of stick once you are able to align with the right people in the organization. And your leadership is essential, obviously, but also, you know, your influencers and the people, you know, on the floor doing all the hard work, you know, that's the best way to drive it home. And we've seen that when we look at it holistically. Yes, the power of the influencers. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right, Bart, how about you? One piece of actionable advice. Yeah, thank, thanks so much, Meredith. Um, I think really driving off, uh, off the back of what Christine was mentioning earlier today as well as really aligning Beha sorry, behaviors against each value. Um, absolutely love, and if it's okay, uh, Christina, definitely borrowing the, the scorecard idea, really helping to um, just make it incredibly crystal clear and understandable for every employee. Um, just providing that rubric or scorecard. If you have four core values, you know, grade each value. This is, these are the five behaviors that we really care about. If we talk about customers first, here are 20 different types of behaviors that we would expect for an individual contributor, a, a level one manager, a level two manager, a director level. And then here are the, the types of, again, indexing, like what bad looks like, what average looks like, what good looks like, and what like superstar level looks like against each of those. I think too often we, uh, we focus on values as kind of just a, um, from a tactical perspective of, we, we read it in a textbook and we know we should be doing it, but I think using, uh, using values as a key competitive advantage by actually continuously weaving it into the DNA, um, starting with the CEO all the way down, 
Um, and again, just really making sure that behaviors are aligned back to each value statement. Um, we'll, we'll, you know, I think that's, that's really where I've seen the great companies set apart from the, the mediocre. Yes, absolutely. All right. So Christina, you kind of kicked off this question, but if we close it out with you, the one piece of actionable advice, the one action people are hurt, someone's going to take. They, all of them said everything I would say. So I think those are incredibly great pieces of advice. I guess, um, I would just add like, this is hard work. This is not, I love that you threw out kombucha. Like I've always said, it's not about pizza and ping pong tables, right? I think that's the really lazy approach to culture. And it's, and it makes your company like look cool and maybe attracts a few folks to your, to your organization, but that does not have legs, right? I mean, those are just nice things that you have and it's kind of table stakes at this point, right? Cause everybody's trying to, trying to do the same things, but it's the hard work of looking yourself in the mirror and saying, not just who do we aspire to be and who do we think we are, but how well are we actually living those things? And that can be really gut-wrenching to say, hey, we say we are, I just talked to a CEO of another company the other day and he said, our values are X, Y, and Z and one of them was transparency. And I said, really, how do you think you're living that? And he's like, I think it's great. And the people that he was with are like, you gotta be kidding me. We know nothing in this organization. In his mind, he was crushing it. And in their minds, it was so far off the mark. So I think being able to truly look yourself in the mirror and do the gut about where you are um, will help you identify to Annalia's uh, piece about finding those few impactful areas. I mean, don't try to boil the ocean. Zero in, take it one by one, and, and you'll, you'll find your chip in a way at making some serious progress. Yes. Oh my gosh. You each bring such a different and rich perspective that's so valuable. But just summarizing those few final things, such gold, finding those essential high leverage things, like Analia said, for Flatiron onboarding, or Desiree focusing on leadership behavior. Uh, I'm going to say again that word behavior, making it not just conceptual, but tracking it all the way to what does that look like in reality to Bart's point, what are those behaviors and even using a scorecard and then doing the hard work and looking yourself in the mirror, which is not easy. So uh, we've all heard the famous Peter Drucker quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast. I will take that further. Culture eats everything. Anything you want to get done is getting shaped by the culture that we're in and behavior is contagious. So how do we scale culture? Start with a simple and clear set of beliefs and reinforce those with every single interaction in the entire employee life cycle from the very first conversation an employee has with your company as a prospective candidate to the very last conversation they have as they leave or even as an alumni. But in closing, if culture eats strategy for breakfast, then we all have the chance to do the work to scale a culture that actually feeds the business and the outcomes that we're committed to and that feeds the potential of the people producing those outcomes. So for everybody on this call, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Go make your version of this real in the world and thank you.